So there have been considerable advances in our understanding of the use of chemotherapy in different subclasses of breast cancer. In particular, there is some recent data looking at the activity of platinums in the setting of triple negative advanced breast cancer. There was a trial called the TNT trial where carboplatin was compared head to head against docetaxel. And for patients who had germline BRCA1 or 2 mutations, uh, the patients uh, responded particularly well to the carboplatin. Moreover, even in the patients who didn't have those mutations, carboplatin fared as well as docetaxel and arguably is probably better tolerated. So there's growing enthusiasm now for the use of platinum salts early on, usually in first line in triple negative metastatic breast cancer. However, since the enthusiasm for platinum is gaining also in early stage disease, now we're often confronted with patients who have already had platinums, either as part of their neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy, and then that makes the difficult decision as to whether to try a platinum again in the first line. After a platinum-based regimen, we're typically using the, the classical sequence of, you know, the most active agents used in, in sequence, you know, probably starting with taxanes uh, and moving through the lines to the vinca alkaloids, to aribulin, uh, et cetera. Um, and in triple negative disease, that is the mainstay of the management of metastatic breast cancer outside of a clinical trial. For steroid receptor positive disease, uh, the principles are nearly the same as for triple negative except for the use of platinum salts is probably uh, less uh, advised. Um, but the principle of using sequential single agents still applies. In the ER positive arena, we're usually starting with the least toxic and most convenient and easy chemotherapeutics. For example, uh, capecitabine is often the first foray into the chemotherapeutics uh, class of treatment uh, from uh, uh, targeting estrogen receptor uh, approaches. So um, after capecitabine, then we typically are looking at probably using uh, taxanes. Vinca alkaloids are also very active. Venerelbine, for example, is very well tolerated, can be given for quite some time until peripheral neuropathy or cytopenias uh, intervene. Uh, aribulin is another active agent. So we move through these lines at the stage of disease progression with each agent. And um, in, in many cases, we try to maybe alternate mechanism of action, too, to try to avoid the same drug classes. For example, if you've used, used a taxane, you may not use another taxane in series. You might want to switch to a different drug class uh, after progression on a taxane. Um, but the principles are largely the same, sequential single agent chemotherapy after progression on endocrine therapy. Finally, for the HER2 positive space, um, Unfortunately, even with the advent of HER2 targeting agents, uh, we're still using chemotherapy combinations because of the synergism between chemotherapeutics and anti-HER2 agents. And this is true both with antibody-based therapeutics as well as small molecules. And um, typically for HER2-positive first-line metastatic disease, we're looking at the Cleopatra trial-like regimens, which was docetaxel, pertuzumab, and trastuzumab. has a major survival advantage. Um, and uh, the only nuance on that update is really that you can probably substitute weekly paclitaxel for docetaxel in that regimen because it is uh, much better tolerated than docetaxel. And in a non-randomized but still sizable clinical trial of weekly paclitaxel, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, the point estimate on the median progression-free survival in that study matched the experimental arm of the Cleopatra trial. So I feel comfortable using weekly paclitaxel in that sense. After progression on a Cleopatra-like regimen with HER2-positive disease, we're typically looking at treating with TDM1 next. Uh, TDM1 uh, is very well tolerated. You just have to monitor the liver function tests and uh, monitor for thrombocytopenia and make dose modifications uh, if needed. Uh, but it's, it's overall particularly well tolerated. doesn't have so many chemo-like side effects compared to giving uh, free uh, chemotherapeutic agents. However, the principle of TDM1 is that it does have a chemotherapeutic species. It's just covalently linked to the trastuzumab antibody backbone. Um, so there are some chemo effects, a little bit of uh, nausea, sometimes some alopecia, uh, et cetera. After that, then we're really looking at uh, uh, lapatinib-based regimens typically, either lapatinib capecitabine, which is FDA approved, or sometimes lapatinib in combination with trastuzumab. 
And then following progression on olipatinib-based regimen, then you're looking basically at a chemo du jour backbone with continued trastuzumab, typically in the salvage setting. Um, so uh, in all subtypes of breast cancer, in the advanced disease setting, we're still using chemotherapy as the mainstay and the backbone of treatment of this disease. Many times, um, it's necessary to um, discuss various chemotherapeutic options with patients uh, because they might have a particular concern about a particular side effect with one class of chemo versus another. And since we have many options to treat patients with various chemotherapeutics, it's often the case that we present a balanced discussion of a range of uh, two or even three different potential chemotherapeutic options. And then based on uh, the description of the expectations in terms of effectiveness, but also side effect profile, patients may weigh in on the decision about which treatment they want to use next uh, based on the toxicity profile. This is a typical approach, and it's often the case that you're not looking at just one type of chemo in a treatment decision for advanced breast cancer.